story starts on Sunday morning, April the 25th, in 1915. Charles Bean, the writer from the Sydney Morning Herald, anxiously paced the deck of a ship off the coast of Turkey. With Charles Bean was photographer Philip Schuller from the Melbourne Age. More than 12,000 troops of the Australian and New Zealand Corps, the Anzacs, waited with him. Their plan was to land on the Gallipoli Peninsula in Turkey, to advance inland, drive the Turkish enemy back, capture the peninsula, and then team up with the British and French to take the capital, Constantinople, now known as Istanbul. Many of them had never been out of Australia before. Most had never seen combat. One in three would be dead or wounded by the end of the day. Nearly 200 vessels of the Allied fleet were now assembled in the largest invasion force in history. As Bean watched the first soldiers climb down the rope ladders to board steam-driven landing vessels to shore, he felt confident this was going to be a cakewalk. The Turk does not realize what is in store for him during the next few hours. As we were landing, many of the others passed close to us in the tugs, and it was hard to realize, as we shouted out our good wishes, that the Australians were going into battle. Of course, they had no, uh, no motors in those days. They were steam. And when they got far enough, they uh, either uh, drifted on in or uh, were rowed in. We got in the ship's boats and got towed ashore and had to jump into the water when we couldn't get any further. The water was up to our chests and cold. There was just a hail of bullets uh, coming down. There was hitting, it was like hailstones in the water, the rifle fire. It was deep water. It was a pretty steep beach. And with all their gear on, they'd go down like a stone. Bean was on the beach with the Anzacs, but not only could he not write the story and get it published because he didn't have the official stamp from the censor, but he didn't have any means. He didn't have email, mobile phone, he had nothing. So he couldn't get his story off the beach. As soon as the Anzacs got their bearings, they could see they'd landed on the wrong beach. They were a kilometre and a half north from where they were meant to have landed at Garpa Tepe. But they had to keep going to drive the Turks up into the hills and away from the beach. Bean wrote that they climbed with such dash that within three quarters of an hour, some had charged over three successive ridges. Each ridge was higher than the last and each party that reached the top went over it with a wild cheer. The Turks had a machine gun in the valley on the left he wrote. It took out three boatloads of our soldiers, which had to stay out there, unreachable, for three days. Oh, I was lucky to say, I got a few hits, but that is nothing. I, you know, the, they weren't dangerous claps until they got both legs belted, uh, and I couldn't walk then. The machine gun got me, and down I went. We were sent to the firing line and they gave us a charge up the hill. The slaughter started and the boys were going down like nine pins. I got a bullet in the leg of my trousers. Unexpectedly, the Turkish reinforcements arrived from the other side of the peninsula and challenged these unsupported Anzacs, forcing them to retreat. The Turks then moved into better positions to defend their cliffs. Mustafa Kemal, the commander of the Turkish Reserve Division, was waiting six kilometers from the high hills and he took his division and met the Australians and New Zealanders and they were pushed back. In the afternoon, they were pushed back about the beaches. This is 25th of April. 
Once the first troops had secured the beach, those who followed established first aid stations, supply depots and built steps to help the stretcher bearers, who would be in great demand from the moment they arrived. The Anzacs now landed their first mountain gun, but had to work hard to haul it into a useful position. After a full day's fighting, thousands of Anzacs were exhausted. Despite the intermittent shelling and rifle fire, most fell asleep wherever they found themselves. Slept where you could, on the ground. Dig a burrow and get in it. Anywhere you could, get a bit of shelter. The Commander-in-Chief of the Anzacs, General William Birdwood, sent an urgent memo to the top brass waiting back on the ships. If we are to re-embark, it must be at once. But the Commander-in-Chief of all the Mediterranean troops, General Sir Ian Hamilton, refused all requests for evacuation. Instead, he sent a glowing report back to London. All the arrangements worked without a hitch and were carried out in complete orderliness and silence and handsomely repulsed the Turkish counterattacks and the line held firm. More critical observers might have described it as a disaster. In truth, 2,000 men were already killed and 1,800 more wounded. But nobody outside Gallipoli would know that for a long time. On the second day of battle, as they watched the first light come over the peninsula, Charles Bean was waiting to hear if they were evacuating or not. He wrote that it was a great achievement to have established a beachhead, but it had been a massacre. The reinforced Turks were now firing down at the Anzac positions with machine guns and rifles. The Anzacs fought back with their 303 rifles to stop advancing Turks dislodging them from the trenches they had just dug. Bean was relieved that the Turkish shelling was less intense than expected. Perhaps because the Allied naval ships offshore continued to bombard the Turkish gun emplacements on the heights. Even here, 12 miles away, I can hear the firing going on. I could not sleep for 60 hours. The battleship's guns shake the ship and thinking of the poor men gets on one's nerves. Finally, General Hamilton sent an order ashore. There is nothing for it but to dig yourselves right in and stick it out. You have got through the difficult business. Now you have only to dig, dig, dig until you're safe. They had everything underground, hospitals, dugouts, communication trenches, wireless stations, you name it, it was all underground. It was only by digging so effectively into the ground at Gallipoli that they survived. And that's where they get the name Diggers. Bean wrote, they bought ashore everything that is needed for the support of an army. Supplies, transport, water, ambulances, four jetties made by pontoons, floating bridges, wireless stations, a Red Cross station, and a large store. The beach was getting very crowded, with parties unloading boats and mule trains and men dragging field guns into position, telegraph and telephone units laying wires, and engineers constructing shelters. The light horsemen had spent months preparing their horses for battle. But at the last minute, the decision was made not to take them off at Anzac Cove. They tried to land a few for working animals with tragic results. So the elite Australian light horsemen had to go ashore as foot soldiers. I was sent ashore in charge of 16 pack horses. 
When we got alongside the beach, a shrapnel burst over us, killing two horses and wounding me. I wanted to sleep near the horses and they let me. They having decided by this time that landing horses was impossible. More men kept landing in open boats. The soldiers felt like sitting ducks and could only hope they wouldn't be picked off by Turkish snipers. They are champion at sniping all the same. Some have been found painted green all over, some up trees, others with bushes tied all around them. It took me some time to distinguish between the echo of the rifles and the ping of the bullets landing in the bushes nearby. Every case was a new experience and another danger passed and we became callous to the terrible sights. The Sydney Morning Herald had not heard from Bean, who was still waiting for his accreditation. But the War Office in London was still reporting good news. The troops on the Gallipoli Peninsula are steadily advancing and have established themselves across the peninsula and repeatedly beaten off all attacks. New Zealand Prime Minister Mr Massey declared a public holiday and Andrew Fisher, the Australian Prime Minister, responded by suggesting everything must be going well or the newspapers would have reported otherwise. Proud of this great start to Australia's war, the nation now waited with bated breath for more good news from the front. May started as a month of inaction. Bean was as disappointed as the soldiers were eager to escape their crowded trenches still so near the beach where they had landed. My dugout is similar to a grave, about three feet deep. If I get back, I might refuse to live in a house, instead dig a hole in the backyard. The men worked continuously to move supplies off the beach and into dugouts to make room on the cluttered shore for the next shipment. Thousands of biscuits and bread loaves had to be produced and a wood fire bakery was set up on Imbros Island. The French made certain they had their priorities right. Bean finally got his accreditation as an official war correspondent on May the 2nd and he sailed down to Cape Helles anxious to inspect the second theatre of the Gallipoli War, occupied by the British. Bean was appalled at the numbers left out to die here. He could not stop himself from doing something about it. There was one chap I could see wounded about 20 yards to my right front. He was moving, so I nipped out of the trench and ran out to him and helped him back. Look here, Bean, an officer shouted at me later. If you do any more of these damn fool actions, I'll send you straight back to headquarters. Sir Ian Hamilton finally went ashore on May the 11th. Already, 10,000 British and 12,000 French casualties had been evacuated from the Cape, many more than those wounded at Anzac Cove. Hamilton called off any further attacks until reinforcements arrived. Bean was not impressed with Hamilton's visit. Wounded were crying, I'm in agony, oh, I'm in agony. But one knew that there was no earthly chance of many of the men near the front line being taken in. It made you mad to think of the dull, stupid, cruel bungling that was mismanaging the medical arrangements run by the British. Everything is late with the British staff. Nothing up to time. No evidence of brains that I have seen. So yeah, he was biased. He couldn't find anything wrong with the Australians. No matter what they did. But everything the British did, he attacked. Back at Anzac Cove, the Anzacs received a message in Morse code from the Turks. We will put you into the seas tomorrow, you Australian bastards. Big guns we will give you. We will give you mines, you Australian bastards. Bean braced himself for action. 
The infantry fixed bayonets and waited in their trenches for the call. True to their word, early the next day, May the 19th, the Turks launched their biggest counterattack, right along the Anzac front line. There was very heavy, loud shell fire along the whole front, and the rattle of machine gun and rifle was incessant. That's where Australia got its first VC. He rushed a machine gun post and killed seven men. The machine gun was uh, bothering the troops that were landing. He was lucky, but uh, it was a brave act too. And uh, he, uh, that was Australia's first VC. During this battle, the Turks killed the legendary John Simpson Kirkpatrick the man with the donkey. Where he got the donkey, no one seems to know, but he had been risking his life in no man's land for three weeks, walking the donkey right up to the front line, picking up a wounded soldier and carrying him back down to the hospital tent. He was fatally hit by a Turkish sniper. After his shooting, other stretcher bearers were ordered not to rescue any wounded men during daylight hours. I was only a hundred yards from the Turks' trenches, and there was a dead man about every yard. Bodies without heads, arms and legs hanging on bushes. It was an awful sight. Heard that Sergeant Bulmar had been killed about six o'clock. I was only speaking to him at 3.30. Attended the funeral at 7.30. Quite a sermon. There was that many dead that uh smell. Unable to bear the stench, Turkish officers climbed out of their trenches with white flags and started burying their own dead. Anzacs led a blindfolded Turkish envoy into General Birdwood's headquarters to arrange an armistice so they could bury the thousands of bodies still out there. A nine-hour truce was planned for the 24th, and the envoy was led back. On that day, the sound of shovels continued without a break. 3,000 Turkish bodies and 169 Australians were buried. This was to be the only truce of the nine-month Gallipoli campaign. For Bean and the Anzacs themselves, the month of June was looking like a complete waste of time. The diggers had little to do apart from digging, which frustrated them. They had volunteered for army service, not bucket and spade brigade. What exactly were they doing here, they wanted to know, when there was a war to be won in Europe? It had all happened so quickly. Less than a year ago, there was the assassination of an Austrian Archduke, which led to an invasion of Belgium by Germany. Then Britain moved in to help France fight the Germans. The Turks then came in to help Germany fight the Russians. And in the blink of an eye, the world was in the middle of a war. The war to end all wars, so they thought. The Australians and New Zealanders had been willing participants. From the outbreak, most political leaders, along with the media, had supported Australia's full involvement. The Australian Prime Minister, Andrew Fisher, had been quick to support Britain, to the last man and the last shilling. Overnight, thousands of young men had volunteered. Out of a population of less than five million Australians, more than 331,000 would sign up before the end of the war. The brother and I, we went down to Victoria Barracks and we enlisted. Now it was his idea, he was only 16, and uh, he tormented the life out of my mother to let him join the army. And of course she gave away in the long run and meant, it meant I had to go too. I couldn't let a young brother go and me stop at home. Two men came over 
and said we heard that you could blow a bugle or a trumpet, you see. So he let me go straight away. My age was 70 and a half. Uh, I enlisted at Boona. They struck up to Marshall Ace. Before I knew what I was doing, I was up there signing on. That's the effect the Marshall Ace had on me. I was 17 when I enlisted. I enlisted in Kodak building in Queen Street. I went there first and struck the compulsory sergeant major who knew my agent. Said, you can't enlist, you're not 18, but there's another office around the corner. It was a wee bit of fun. Turned 19 on your liberally. And we were there for nine months. So I was only 18 when we landed there. The way they treated Belgium, I think that's the thing that really made me want to go and uh, do something to the Germans. I told them I was 18 and I was 16. And uh, if you were big enough, you were good enough. They were recognised as the best, best infantry in the world. A completely volunteer army. With Federation declared only 14 years before, the young nation had yet to prove itself on the world stage, and here was its chance. Sailing from Australia, they all thought they were going to France. The Anzacs were only told about the Turkey invasion once on board. It was on this long sea passage where the photographer Schuller had the time to perfect his craft, recording everything from improvised tattoo sessions to official vaccinations. Philip Schuller was the only son of the editor of the age. He was, I think, a photojournalist before the word was invented and uh, he, he volunteered to, to go and cover the Gallipoli campaign and they didn't know it was Gallipoli at the time, they knew it was a, an Australian expeditionary force who was going overseas. So he volunteered to do it and with, unsure of where they were heading but you've got to remember that the context that it was, that they started the, the war in was that they were going for a great adventure. Most of these boys had no experience with war of any kind and hoped they would be well trained in Egypt. your boots off to go inside the pyramids. I didn't much for mine, I'm not taking mine off. I wouldn't trust that you but I reckon you wouldn't have any boots when you came out. Bean and Schuller got to know each other well, even taking photos of each other on the pyramids. The two men formed a strong bond, which would stand them in good stead once they found themselves working side by side at Gallipoli. At the moment, the main issue was disease, now claiming more lives than the Turks. Part of the problem was the shortage of clean water, which all had to be imported. Two of our water barges have been sunk during the last two days, Bean wrote. The Anzacs stationed up the gully were allowed only one bottle of water a day and had to wash in a well unfit for drinking. One soldier, who would know only too well, was a young boxer from Tasmania, a water carrier at the time, Alec Campbell. The water was carried up from the beach in can, large cans. Uh, and it's, all the water had to be carried up to the line. There was always a chance of getting hit uh, every day. Uh, uh, someone got hit. He would become the world's last survivor of Gallipoli, 
the last out of one million who fought there. The commander of the combined divisions of New Zealand and Australia moved through the troops to lift the flagging morale. He congratulated the diggers, delivered a pep talk, and called for three hearty cheers for king and country, which at least confirmed that support for King George was still strong. The Turks would have found this difficult to understand and had little idea why Australia was fighting for England. Possibly they were asking themselves why Turkey was fighting for Germany, although they were at least defending their homeland. And Australian and the New Zealand people did not come here as they wanted, but they were pushed by the British people. Couldn't, couldn't um, understand, you know, at all, none of them could, why we were fighting for England. You see, they're quite good people too. Bean wrote that the Turkish trenches were so close that you can hear the Turks talking at night, laughing. Sometimes we smell their tobacco. Another day he wrote, 17 Turks surrendered and walked right through our men who slapped them on the back and gave them cigarettes. Bean truly felt the soldiers of the opposing sides had come to respect each other like two sporting teams on a football field. The Turkish prisoners are so delighted with the treatment meted out to them that you would have to drive them back with the bayonet if you wanted them to return to their own people. They are as happy as larrikins. The inevitable happened. The first cases of typhoid fever appeared on Lemnos Island, the hospital island just off the coast. By now, the disease-ridden Anzacs were ripe for the picking and could easily have been seduced by enemy propaganda. When the Turkish aircraft dropped leaflets, Bean caught one. Australians and New Zealanders surrender and we will treat you well. The British men have abandoned you to your fate and soon your supplies will be cut off and you will be exposed to starvation and thirst. You are not fighting out of hate that England made you fight. Don't further hesitate. Come and surrender. At last, on June the 25th, two months after the landing, Bean wrote, My first reports in papers from Australia arrived today. But instead of rewarding him for these first responsible stories, the army decided to banish Bean from Anzac Cove transferring him to Imbros Island, where they planned to establish a camp for war correspondents. The army wanted to increase its control over Bean and other correspondents by feeding them only suitable information. Today, Bean wrote, I counted 404 men bathing on the beach and a lot more sitting down there, half-dressed, browning their back. It was quiet, quite like a Sunday today with very few shells. Even so, the price of a dip was too often death from a sniper. The Turks hit the ammunition dump at the southern end of Anzac Beach damaging 50 rifles and setting fire to two boxes of ammunition. They also hit a man in the water and took off his arm, and he came out of the water holding it. I heard there were eight casualties on the beach, but bathing went on as usual. I went in for a swim, and uh, we were in there for a while. There was a splash was like. Splashes of bullets. They were. They're nice there, bugger. Shoot never. The Anzacs up on the ridges were also very good with rifles. They invented the periscope rifle, which became a major tool of trench warfare. We can snipe a bit of Turk country where the latrines are and occasionally a chap jumps up in a devil of a hurry and scuttles off with miles of shirt hanging out and trousers half off. 
I don't think it's very sporting to shoot them sitting. Dug in so close together, the Anzacs were getting to know their enemy better every day. Five o'clock is dinner hour for the Turks. They leave their rifles and bunch together in trenches, eating from one large dish. Many Turks look upon this war as a holy war, but they are all discontented at its duration and desire peace. The Turks are fine big fellows, badly clothed and underfed, but they are very brave and sometimes have jokes with us. They wish us good night and let us know if a shot misses them. They do this by waving a rifle or a shovel. From a new batch of Turkish prisoners, Bean learnt something of the latest enemy tactics. They would not be attacking, but rather waiting for the Anzacs to attack them, in the belief more Anzacs would be killed in that way. About 250 men left Anzac yesterday, Bean wrote. Most of them seriously sick with diarrhea, but some cases may be typhoid. The Australian Army nursing sisters had more than they could handle at the general hospital established on Lemnos Island. The side doors between the decks on the Red Cross ship were open and we could see the lovely nurses upon the promenade decks. They looked like angels to us. Back on Gallipoli, another Australian legend was beginning to emerge. Lieutenant Colonel John Monash, an engineer in his late 40s from Victoria, was proving to be one of the most competent officers at Gallipoli and would soon be promoted to the rank of general. Later, at the Western Front in France, he would command the Australian Army so successfully, he became the first soldier in 200 years to be knighted in the field of battle by the King of England. And the last. By the end of July, Bean was able to strike up a deal with the Army to continue to cover the fighting. But he had to submit all his stories to the censor. A British journalist Ellis Ashmead Bartlett didn't even land, but he saw what happened from the ships and he interviewed a few people and he got the scoop of the century. It went right around the world, including the Australian newspapers. Ellis Ashmead Bartlett pipped Bean at the post. So Bean never forgave him for that. It was devastating for Bean. July 25th. Bean wrote that the Anzacs were starting to become resentful of the privileges enjoyed by their officers. One had threatened an officer, saying he was tired of digging secure dugouts for officers or washing shirts for them in a bucket of water, while other men had unsafe dugouts and were short of drinking water. By contrast, a cup of tea was sometimes the only thing the regular men had to sustain them. Back home, Australians now greeted the first returned wounded. Going by the Sydney Morning Herald report of their arrival, a new reality was emerging. Here was war, real war, brought home to our very eyes, in the maimed and limping legs, in the bandaged arms and hands, in the dark glasses one was wearing, in the scar upon another's cheek. We saw war. So they gather the crippled, the wounded and maimed, and they shipped us back home to Australia. The legless, the armless, the blind and insane, those proud wounded heroes of Suvla. And when our ship pulled into Circular Quay, I looked at the place where me legs used to be. And thank Christ, there was nobody waiting for me to grieve, to mourn and to pity. At last, some action. Hamilton's plan for August was to establish a third Allied base at Suvla Bay. With this, he believed surely they could capture and control the highest hilltops, the Sari Bear Range, and drive the Turks from the Gallipoli Peninsula. 
Anticipation filled the air. Bean was excited about the prospect of successful advances and good stories. After a hundred days marking time, his Anzacs were about to strike again. They sharpened their bayonets and prepared for an assault. Monash instructed the troops to sew white patches six inches deep on both arms and a white patch eight inches wide on the back of their uniforms before they went into battle to distinguish them from the Turks. On August the 6th, the first battle started from Cape Hellas. 26,000 British rifles and 13,000 French troops charged towards 40,000 well-entrenched Turks. The fighting was brutal. Unfortunately, they soon ran short of ammunition and so faced an impossible task. They were slaughtered. Gladys, if you see the articles in the papers, as I have done, of Turks running, don't believe it. They are lies. One Turk is equal to one Australian any day. They publish an awful lot of lies about the poor Turk, but they have done braver things than any English man here. Meanwhile, the British reinforcements landing down at Suvla Bay met almost no resistance. But rather than driving forward, Lieutenant General Stopford ordered his troops to rest easy, make cups of tea, and even play some soccer. The Turks, who had actually been caught napping, quickly rushed troops into place, and the British advantage was lost. They, they uh, landed on this nice wide open beach, and the idea was that they should go around the back of where we were, I believe that was the idea. Instead of that, they stopped and had breakfast on the beach and went swimming and made a picnic of it. The second assault would be high above Anzac Cove at Lone Pine. To soften the Turks' resistance, the Allies delivered a massive bombardment from 100 guns and howitzers, four cruisers, three monitors and several destroyers. Bean wrote, the Australians rushed forward in the assault with the fury of fanatics, little heeding the tremendous shrapnel fire and enfolding rifle fire. As they hit the top, the Anzacs couldn't believe their eyes. The Turks had built log roofs over the top of their trenches. Unfazed, the Anzacs fired through gaps in the logs, tore them apart and leapt into the dark caverns below. It was one of the bloodiest battles of the Anzac campaign. With the help of reinforcements over the next three days and nights, the Anzacs eventually captured Lone Pine. It was a real victory, but at a heavy price. The dead lay so thick in the captured trenches that the only respect which could be paid to them was to avoid treading on their faces. You could not tell the difference between our dead and Turkish dead because their faces went so black. The Turks are lying dead under the floor of the trench. We had to sleep on top of them. I think our losses would have been eight to one, but we got the trenches. Lone Pine was the biggest achievement of the Anzacs in the entire time at Gallipoli because it was a frontline trench. It was held by the Turks. It was covered in pine ceilings and they rushed forward, they tore the pine ceilings off, they jumped into the trench, they killed all the Turks and they took it over. 
In the third major action of the day, the New Zealanders attacked Chunuk Bear and Monash attacked Hill 971. Finally, Bean's turn came. The bullet with his name on it found its target. Something gave me a whack, like a stone thrown hard in the upper part of the right leg. Wounded and bleeding, Bean limped to a dressing station where the doctor treated him, gave him a whiskey, and recommended he be evacuated to avoid infections. Refusing to leave, Bean agreed to rest, but not before he persuaded Shula to update him on the fighting so they could keep sending stories and photos. Charles Bean was wounded at the time and uh, he didn't want anyone to know. In case he was removed, I think he had, a, he had a very large dedication to his job, Charles Bean. And Shula helped nurse him through and certainly Shula looked up to, to Bean. One of the biggest catastrophes of these August battles was at the Neck. The Anzacs charged in the most hopeless action of Gallipoli. This charge was directed by a number of Boer War veterans and cavalry officers who seemed unaware of the invention of the machine gun. They ordered successive waves of 150 light horsemen to climb up over the top of their trench and charge across open ground towards a line of machine gunners. Even when they witnessed the first massacres, the officers ordered it to proceed. How any of us are alive today to tell the tale beats me. I was shot and had to lie up in the hills for two days before they could get me down to the beach. I was put onto one of the boats where they took my leg off. Of the 500 officers and men who charged, half were killed or wounded, and most of the bodies had to be left out there. Bean wrote, over the whole summit, the figures lay still in the quivering heat. We lost a terrible lot of men, really. I would say, and the British. In revenge for the latest carnage from these three battles, some of the Anzacs now mistreated the prisoners of war held in a cage on the beach. Bean, who felt Anzac officers were not honoring the international conventions of war, could only watch as some diggers poured a tin of kerosene along the ground, laying a trail stretching into a wire compound, and then lighting it with a match. As caddish an act as I ever saw in my life, with each passing day, the Turkish divisional commander, Mustafa Kemal, determined to defend his homeland, mustered even more reinforcements and was now ordering bigger attacks along all new fronts. The Anzacs were running short of ammunition and had problems getting supplies of food and water to the front line. After the great loss of life in these three August offensives, Lord Kitchener called for another 100,000 recruits by Christmas, concluding, blood and bone and iron alone can win the present struggle. Despite all the defeats of August, the slow learning commanders in charge still believed they should remain at Gallipoli. Although, in September, something would happen that would shake even them from their lethargy. Oh well, Mum, we're still living in the same dugout, so if you get time, you can call round and see us and have tea. But I am dreading the wet weather as we have no real provision made, nor can we make any for the rain. Well, Mum, no good meeting trouble halfway, so still cheerful. The food is plentiful, but lack of variety and vegetables was certainly detrimental to the health of the troops. There's still a lot of sickness about. More men are being evacuated with dysentery than with wounds. We are all suffering from Baku rot. 
Bean finally got the dreaded dysentery in early September, just as Keith Murdoch, Rupert Murdoch's father, arrived at Gallipoli to cover the war for the opposition press. Bean had beaten him for the job of Australia's official war correspondent. But there was no animosity between them. Bean was happy to brief Murdoch on the situation, as long as he could keep up with the demands of his dysentery. Murdoch could see immediately that the battle was unwinnable, and after only three days on the peninsula, he had seen enough and left. Unbeknown to Bean, Murdoch had left Anzac with a letter written by the rebel English correspondent Ellis Ashmead Bartlett, which soundly condemned the whole Gallipoli campaign and recommended immediate evacuation. It was the bombshell that would change the thinking on Gallipoli in both countries. It read, The unfortunate Dardanelles expedition was undoubtedly one of the most terrible chapters in our history, as there has been a series of disastrous underestimations. We cannot hide from the Turks, nor can we hide the position of our guns, and repeatedly damage is done to them. And the sick rate would astonish you. We must be evacuating 1,000 sick and wounded men every day. Ashmead Bartlett was expelled from Gallipoli for giving Murdoch the letter in the first place. But it had worked and would have dire consequences for Gallipoli and all those in command. By the 19th of September, chill had started causing the many men still in summer uniforms to shiver. Both sides employed aerial reconnaissance to gain a better understanding of the other side's positions. Aerial shots of Anzac Cove show the landscape had become a littered patchwork of paths and trenches. The censors were driving Bean crazy, cutting his stories and forbidding him to take and send photographs when, by contrast, any swindler or rule breaker of an officer who gets a film or photo smuggled home past the censor could get it published in the London press, where some can get £1,000 for them. In fact, close to 70,000 photos were taken during the Gallipoli campaign. Kodak had been running its main sales campaign with Gallipoli as an exotic destination not to go unrecorded. Kodak was advertising in the mainstream media during Gallipoli, trying to get the mums or the dads of the soldiers to buy a camera at great expense and send it over to Gallipoli and give their son the opportunity to take snaps of his life at Gallipoli and send them back. But once the news started getting back, the campaign had gone really badly wrong and there were thousands of Australians killed. It was decided by the Kodak management that it was now bad taste to try and get their cameras taken to Gallipoli to film this disaster, so they withdrew the ads. In Sydney, another 300 wounded soldiers came ashore. Again, the maimed and disfigured soldiers sent a shudder through the unsuspecting loved ones and spectators who had come to greet them. Enlistment was dropping even more. The Herald ran a story headlined, Here is some straight talk to the slackers. The Sydney Mail newspaper also criticised what they called shirkers. Conscription would be contested and fought over, but it was never introduced. Critics of the war were now pushing to hear the word evacuation. Bean would be the last official press man standing and in the perfect position to record any evacuation. 
which the diggers hoped would come before the unforgiving winter finished off the Anzacs. There were now more than 100,000 Allied troops on the three battlefields, Anzac Cove, Suvla Bay and Cape Helles, without any strategy that called for forward assaults. The ordinary soldiers were becoming demoralized, depressed and disillusioned. They wanted action. Both sides seemed to have got tired of sniping at one another and I was surprised to find our chaps and the Turks exposing heads and shoulders above the parapets, waving their arms and shouting to one another. Bully beef and tobacco were thrown across from one trench to the other. I remember a tin beef called Fay Bentish. It came from South America, I think. Um, and it was beastly stuff. Things had changed now. And the diggers probably felt they had more in common with the enemy privates just 20 metres away than with their hard-hearted commanders back in headquarters. Any Turkish prisoners taken were put to work, earning their keep. A soldier quoted in the Sydney Morning Herald said, the trenches were only 20 yards apart. We were yarning to each other and exchanging beef, biscuits and cigarettes when one of the Turks cried out, get in quickly, here comes a German officer and he's going to open fire with a machine gun. Our boys quickly ducked, but only just in time for, sure enough, a machine gun was started. Bean predicted they would be hard pressed to survive once the winter high seas started battering the flimsy settlement, turning the dugouts into mud ponds. The Anzacs could be washed back into the sea without the Turks having to lift a finger. With the increasing rain, more than water was washing down from the heights where the dead Anzacs still lay unburied. On the 25th of October, Bean wrote, six months today since we landed, another wet, wintry day, bitterly cold with a misty rain. It was turning into the coldest winter in Turkey in 40 years. Shivering in his wet, cold dugout, Bean celebrated his 36th birthday. He wrote, received a parcel from mother towel, soap, three pairs of socks, sweets, writing paper, just the right things. Alarmed by falling enlistments, King George issued a desperate appeal to Australians. I appeal to you as more men and yet more men are wanted to keep my armies in the field and secure victory and enduring peace. I ask you men of all classes to come forward voluntarily and take your share in the fight and uphold Britain's past traditions and the glory of her arms. The government was also calling upon the women of Australia to chip in with their time and their pennies. Already the munitions factories were full of female workers. Millions more shells, bullets, rifles and cannons were needed. Expelled from the war zone and back in London, Ashmead Bartlett now fought back with a vengeance, talking and writing about the worsening problems of Gallipoli and urging the Allies to evacuate as soon as possible. One article read, The Allies would never get to Constantinople and if they did, the Turks would never surrender. Undoubtedly, the biggest change in leadership to occur in October, if not the entire campaign, was the sacking of Sir Ian Hamilton, the commander of the entire operation. Bean confided in his diary, The British War Council believed Hamilton had been incompetent, too secretive and unable to communicate his ideas to his officers.
Hamilton's replacement would be General Munro, a veteran of conflicts in India, the Boer War, and fresh from the Western Front. Munro toured the different positions the Anzacs had secured, interviewed officers, moved through the trenches, and looked up at the Turkish gun emplacements above. By the end of the day, he had seen enough. Without a backward glance, he returned to headquarters to write up his conclusion. Evacuate all troops from the Gallipoli Peninsula. It was a big decision, but in typically British bureaucratic tradition, he asked for a second opinion and recommended Lord Kitchener come and see for himself. With so many soldiers dying from disease, he believed the sooner Kitchener arrived, the better. As Bean had predicted, terrible storms lashed Anzac Cove in November, bringing rain that washed their flimsy structures away. The foul weather also meant supply boats could not get to the landing piers, many of which were now broken. Worst of all, the mail boat sank with thousands of Christmas letters written by the Anzacs. The men braved the cold water to save what they could. Everyone here is very gloomy over the news of the sinking of the steamer carrying the outgoing mail. But I think the loss of the incoming mail is a lot worse. Lost letters have a marvelously depressing influence on troops. By the second day of the storm, November the 18th, high seas had smashed all the piers except one. Nothing was coming ashore. Here, Bean wrote that there was not enough wood to boil water, nor fodder for the animals, no spare lighters for bringing more water, and only one pier on which to unload them. The soldiers hated the army for not issuing them with timber and iron for shelters and warm clothing. They would have mutinied had they been on a ship. We are on half rations, biscuits and cheese, how we hate the sight of those biscuits. We get half a pint of tea a day. We are making pack mules of ourselves carrying boxes of biscuits and petrol tins full of water and other stores. No wonder we common pack animals growl and use bad language. It was up to Lord Kitchener to approve or not the end of the Gallipoli campaign. As a fan of Churchill's original idea, he was reluctant to admit failure, but once on the ground, even he would have to see it was unwinnable. I don't think much of Kitchener at all. And he said the Australians would be all right as siege troops, or, uh, but he said they'd be no good as an attacking force, my God, he couldn't, he couldn't have made a worse mistake. Well, we didn't like the English uh, send... No, we didn't like them. We, we called them pommies and... No, we didn't like... We didn't get on well with them at all. Finally, the long-awaited visit from Lord Kitchener happened. On November the 13th, Bean wrote, he had scarcely reached the end of the pier when men began to run from the dugouts above. One of the men on the beach called for a cheer and the sound of the cheering brought every Australian on the hillside out of his burrow and scuttling down like rabbits. Thank you, men. The king asked me to tell you how splendidly he thinks you have done. You have done splendidly, better even than I thought you would. Lord Kitchener inspected the ridges, walked down the trenches and through the firing line to Bully's Gap. Then he looked at the Turks from observation posts and interviewed his officers. After two and a half hours being recorded, Kitchener left to submit his report. He cabled London. The country is much more difficult than I had imagined. The Turkish positions look like natural fortresses. However, as they could not advance, he recommended evacuating. Back in London, now fully aware his Dardanelles campaign had failed, Winston Churchill resigned from the British War Ministry. 
London's Daily Telegraph said it all. The public will associate his retirement with the unfortunate lack of success at the Dardanelles. He later enlisted in the army as an officer and was sent to the Western Front. Bean compared the impending disaster to the earlier fiasco of Britain's Crimean War. The Anzacs were being sacrificed to that pure British incompetence, he told his diary. The British nation has not the brains to make war. It is much better at manufacturing socks. By the same token, our winter clothing is not landed yet. Then, on the 28th of November, the first snowstorm hit the Gallipoli Peninsula. The snow was frozen. All the pools of water were masses of ice. This was some novelty after the hot winds and sand of Egypt. But very cold. As bad as the worst snow I've ever seen in Ballarat. But I was there right to the end then. And it was cold, it was snowy. Like everyone, Bean now had to walk around to keep warm. I can't work here, only walk. An issue of rum to all the troops tonight, poor beggars. The novelty of the snow will soon wear off. But they are clever at making the best of things, making fires in a hole in the trench wall with a, a few sticks in a broken biscuit box. Bean came to Gallipoli with an adoration of the Bushmen. And of course, a lot of the people that came to fight at Gallipoli were Bushmen. And they were very handy. They knew how to dig a trench, they knew how to light a fire, they could boil a billy. Nothing was too bad for them, you know, they could, they could put up with anything. On the last day of November, the sun came out to warm the miserable settlement. Bean noted, the last steamboat had been sunk and there was nothing to work this army's communications with. Seizing the moment, the Turks renewed their charges across no man's land in an attempt to recover the Lone Pine trenches, sending a large shell through the roof of the tent hospital, full of patients. It seemed the enemy was never going to accept the Anzacs on their beach. Evacuation seemed the only option. But could the British make up their minds in time? Most Anzacs now hoped December would be their last month on the peninsula. But how could they get out alive, with the Turks watching their every move? Back in London on the 7th of December, the British cabinet finally approved the evacuation. It was official, but still top secret. They appointed an Australian, Major General Brudnell White, to head the operation. First thing Brudnell White did was instruct various units to have everything packed and ready to move in 24 hours. Still more troops from Gallipoli. We heard some disquieting stories that the British are evacuating the peninsula and giving it back to the Turk. It might be a tale, but some of the chaps just back from Anzac say it's right. That'd be a nice turn up. After all the months of struggling and fighting, it just doesn't make any sense. Time was running out. Everything now depended on the weather. If a storm hit the settlement with only three days to go, any planned evacuation would have to be called off. Brudnell White put the word around that he needed his men to develop more tricks to fool the Turks. Lance Corporal William Scurry came up with the drip self-firing rifle a delayed action device used for firing a 303 rifle. Water dripping from one bully beef tin down to another operated weights that pulled the trigger, creating the illusion that soldiers were still there firing rifles. That was one of many tricks. They also had um, all sorts of uh, dummies and, and fake people in different situations which the Turks could see. And so it was very, very successful. The tip is we are going tonight. 
Fatigue parties are working today, burying ammunition. Rifles, picks, shovels, barrows, periscopes, hundreds of cases of ball ammunition. Bombs in galore are buried in the latrines, cesspits. Great suspense among our fellows. On December the 16th, with two days to go, Bean wrote, The men aren't sorry to leave. They do regret leaving all their comrades buried here, and the number of demands for timber for graves has been enormous. I think when people think of Gallipoli, they not only need to think about Charles Bean, but they also need to think about Philip Schuller. Certainly, a lot of our understanding about what it was that the Gallipoli campaign left us have come through, through Philip's pictures. Everyone knows the images, not many people know the name Schuller, and I think at the 90th anniversary it's a time we redress that. Bean went on a nostalgic tour of the settlement, taking final photographs. He could make out some of the ploys the men were using to deceive the Turks. Men smoking and lounging about in sight of the Turks like everything was normal but having to dodge shells as they did so. Others carried water around and around in circles. I found the light horse playing cricket while the shells were flying overhead, Bean wrote. Birdwood finally made the secret plan public. December the 18th was going to be the day, E-Day, evacuation day. None of you should feel in the least disheartened because we all know we have never been beaten and we have prevented the Germans from using the best fighting troops of the Turkish army elsewhere. We have fully played our part. 20,000 Anzacs were standing by waiting for nightfall so they could sneak across the beach and off the peninsula. The second 20,000 men were due to exit the following night if the Turks did not discover the plan and attack in the meantime. As the sun went down and darkness enveloped the settlement, the soldiers crept in silence out of their trenches and dugouts and headed for the beach in a long procession right up till dawn on December the 19th. So the troops won't lose their road to the beach Rice and flour and oatmeal have been sprinkled along all the paths and tracks. We have orders to wrap sandbags over our boots and so deaden the sound as we move off. We move out with rags wrapped over our bayonets so as not to shine. By the time the sun had risen, this first lot had all disappeared. And that's about the best organised thing of the lot. They uh, had, uh, you had to keep a, to a path it was night time, and uh, uh, they were trying to uh, get away uh, without the Turks knowing where we were going. On the following night, the remaining Anzacs sneaked out of their trenches in small parties of about 30. They also clambered onto lighters that transported them away to Suvla and to waiting trawlers. From his ship at anchor, Bean recorded the final stages of the evacuation minute by minute, just as he had recorded the landing nine months before. At 7.05 a.m., as planned, the ships opened fire on all the stores and ammunition which had been put in a heap on the beach and painted white. I suppose you know all about the evacuation by now. It seems sad to think that we had to leave the place where we did such hard fighting and where we have left so many mates. But no doubt it was necessary. Otherwise we would not have done it. It was splendidly carried out. Under the Turks' nose, the Australian Major General Brudnell White and his staff pulled out a total of 80,000 troops from Anzac Cove and Suvla Bay along with 5,000 horses and mules, 2,000 vehicles and 200 guns, without losing a man. Well, it's an extraordinary end to a fine history, Bean concluded. 
The Turks at last have got it, the place they never could take, by our quietly leaving it in the night. And, in the end, perhaps the greatest success we have achieved there is quietly giving it to them without their knowing it. And so ended the story of Gallipoli for Charles Bean. However, not the story of his war, because Bean went on to the Somme, where until 1918 he covered every battle the way he covered the campaign at Gallipoli. And he distinguished himself. He wrote the official history, seven volumes, millions of words, two million words. And he went on to found the Australian War Memorial. He's one of the giants in Australian history. It all started from being at Gallipoli. Gallipoli had been a devastating campaign. The final death toll was shocking. 86,692 Turkish soldiers. 21,255 British. 10,000 French. 8,709 Australians. And 2,701 New Zealanders. The Anzacs, from the legend that Bean, Schuller and others like Ashmead Bartlett had created, continued fighting for three more years in the killing fields of France. By the time it came to an end with Armistice Day, November the 11th, 1918, 15 million lives were wasted, 61,000 of which were Australian. Truly, the worst count of all Australian wars. Let's hope the legend can become a lesson as we commemorate its 90th anniversary. It was a waste of time. We didn't do anything there. What did we learn there? I don't think we learned anything. Yeah, we shouldn't go to war uh, to help another, another country. There's only one reason to go to war, and that is to defend your own country. World War I is part of Australia's history. I don't like war, I'll put it that way. I'm not frightened. If I had to, I would, but I don't like it. Try and live in peace without war. It's saying the sacrifices that these chaps made, that some paid the penalty, death penalty, that they're free today and they're, they're able to enjoy the freedom of Australia, something they should never forget. I've told you all I know about Gallipoli. I can't help you anymore. I detest the place. And their ghosts may be heard as they march by that billabong. Oh, Come a waltzing Matilda 